Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is a remarkable woman. She was a legend as a professor at the Indian Institute of Management for more than a decade. She's been a visiting professor at Harvard University, but is best known for her work on environment and sustainable development. She was the leading light, the founder, the first chairman of the National Waste and Development Board, and is associated with several organizations and initiatives, including that of the World Bank, that look at environment and sustainable development, spirituality and development, and a whole range of issues associated with that. I'm delighted to welcome Kamla Chadri. Thank you. Uh, Kamla ji, you have uh, most recently in your own personal interest and work been looking at, uh, at issues of dharma and development. <laughs> And uh, the World Bank has, you know, the Wolfenson set up this uh, consultative committee and spoke to spiritual leaders about spirituality yeah. and development. Why the sudden waking up uh, to, to notions of religion, spirituality and, and development? Well, interesting question. Um, I, as you know, have been concerned with development issues and have felt that we haven't really moved forward. And if you read the history of our last 50 years, if anything, it looks as if we are moving in the reverse direction. The gap between the poor and the rich is increasing, not only in India, but all over developing countries. And one begins to think that we have so many great intellectuals in our country, we had brilliant people like Panditji and so on. And Gandhiji's great influence, what has happened to our country? And I think I've come to the conclusion that we have been following the wrong road to development and consequently we haven't been able to sort out our real problems. And I think Gandhiji had the pulse of the people. When you say real problems, what are the real problems? I think the sense? real problems are really poverty, a sense of self-respect and dignity, a sense of connection with your past, which has a future. Uh, in, in the negative sense, not just being a westernized Indian, which many of us are, because we did have much of our education in the West, or even in India by Western institutions. Who, in a sense, tended to offer the best education that was available uh, in, in yes, many ways. Yes, yes, best in the sense of a Westernized model, I think. I don't think we learned, at least I didn't, in the convent that I was, didn't really learn anything about my culture. I don't think I knew anything about Gita, and I don't think I understood the whole philosophy of Buddha or Gandhi or any of these things. But why is that uh, important in, because a, in, in the think globalized if you environment? Want to and, uh, develop, I think uh, moral concerns are important. And I, I think the great success of Gandhi, who was a great politician but also a great saint, was his great emphasis on the spirituality of it. And I feel Wolfenson, who heads the World Bank, um, seems to be realizing that. I don't think he's able to change the World Bank, but he is trying to get spirituality, faith, moral concern, voices of the poor, in the World Bank to understand the issues of poverty and how to deal with them. I don't think he's going to succeed very much, but, but that doesn't matter. I think. Do you really think this is anything more uh, uh, significant or substantial than tokenism? Isn't this a voice that is already drowning in the, in the cacophony of uh, liberalization, globalization, uh, capitalism that's overwhelming the globe? I know that that's precisely why the voice that Wolfenson is raising through the World Faith Development Dialogue is important. It's a small voice, 
but I do think that this small voice needs to penetrate what is happening in globalization and, uh, and the kind of modern technologies we are pursuing. And I, I think this voice is going to grow because the numbers of poor are increasing enormously. And it's not only the poverty problem, but the whole environmental field, that unless you begin to treat nature somewhat in a sacred fashion, you're destroying the universe you live in. You've been involved with the whole issue of uh, environment and sustainable development um, with, with, with numerous uh, international, global institutions. Uh, fundamentally, unless sort of the, the, the self-interest of the, you know, the major polluters, the more powerful, uh, influential uh, countries is, is, is most immediately affected, we don't really see uh, any significant uh, moves forward. No, no, I agree with you. I, I think that's precisely the problem, that if you keep on looking at self-interest, then you're going to make the universe worse. And it is true, the Western nations, but not only the Western nations, our own nations are looking at self-interest. And unless, like the Dalai Lama says, you look with compassion, with what is happening to other people, you're not going to change the world. I think that's quite true. But I do think that the influence of the Dalai Lama is spreading. I find very many more people abroad who talk about concerns of doing things for others. And I think there are new Gandhians emerging all over the place, and I think the 21st century will be a century where Gandhian ideas of, um, of um, real concern for the poor and consequently changing one's own lifestyles mm -hmm. is going to become important. You spent a decade teaching at the Indian Institute of Management and, and you were a, a legend and, and, and dare I add that there were numerous students who had sort of huge crush on you, you were this icon. Uh, and, and you groomed a whole sort of generation of, uh, of managers and people uh, who are really working predominantly, primarily, in, in, in the culture that you are now uncomfortable with. Yes. Uh, is, uh, when, when, this, when did this begin to sort of grow upon you? Uh, was it something that was happening at the IIMs when you were teaching these perfect business models? No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> it's funny, I began to to change, if I could use that word, when I joined the Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of traveling in rural areas. And I began to see problems in a very different light. Mm -hmm. The Management Institute was a partnership with Harvard University. Mm -hmm. And I think we did a little better because we did use the case studies and what the cases were in the Indian scene and situation. Mm -hmm. But I think um, we are producing very good managers, but these are managers for global concern. These are not managers who are going to solve the poverty issues in, in poor countries. You have also been interested in, in, in the working of uh, spiritual organizations and how uh, many of the development projects that are run by uh, religious organizations in India uh, tend to be sometimes the most successful, the most effective, uh, the most uh, committed, the cleanest, the least corrupt. Um, what have been the lessons that you learned from, from their styles and structures of management? You're a management guru. No, no, I'm not a guru. <laughs> not a management guru, but I began to see some of these institutions which I read in the papers about the development activities that they had embarked on, not as their primary concern, but as a part of their religious discourse and as part of their interaction with their own uh, um, people who, who follow in their belief systems. Now, I must say I was utterly amazed mm -hmm. at the success of what they had done. And they began to wonder really with all the development agencies and all the money that pours in in development activities, 
here are people who really have made a difference, especially to the poor people. I think the Swadhaya movement, which you perhaps already know, I visited about two years ago or three years ago. And I was amazed, really, at... Uh, but nobody reports about them. Once in a while, you see something in the papers about what they have done. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where Gandhi was great. He knew this language, mm -hmm. but he believed in, in the spirituality of it. Mm -hmm. And he was able to ignite these people, as I think some of these agencies are doing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know many, but I know this Vadhaya group. And I think they've done a wonderful job in, um, I think, even better in terms of the Harijan work of untouchability that Gandhiji was interested. I think the Swadhais have done even better, actually. Whole communities completely changed. For those of our uh, viewers who don't know about the Swadhaya movement, can you tell us briefly about movement and who runs it and what it is about? Here's your opportunity. Press doesn't report it. We're on national television. Well, Tell I us. don't know too much about it myself, but um, Padurang Shastri, who is a Gita teacher in Bombay, has been sending out groups to people in terms of uh, helping people, not asking anything, and they don't take money from people. And these people are encouraged to give service. And this service is and really, I, this is in some ways Indian philosophy. There is no difference between you and me. You have the same blood in you as I have. And therefore, the Harijan and the Patel are brothers is the kind of language they use. And you see these Harijan communities in Ahmedabad are absolutely model communities mm -hmm. of cleanliness, of every single child going to school, girls and boys the burtons in their kitchen shining bright. I mean, I've never seen a, a community of that kind, not once, but all over the place. And I think this is, this is one of the major things Gandhiji wanted to do. He did something, but I think the Swadhaya group has done Taken a remarkable further. job in terms of moving forward, uh, in terms of the differences. In, or you look at the fishing communities, and what they have done to revive a uh, sense of pride, the alcoholism has gone, women wearing these saris and radios and television sets. I mean, it's a change that we talk in Delhi, mm -hmm. but don't know how to move. And I think we have lessons to learn from some of these movements. I think many movements are only spiritual and don't do developmental activities. Mm -hmm. But there are many who do. I was also interested in, you know, what are the, uh, is it sort of management techniques that are being used uh, that, that you can sort of analyze? Is it just charismatic leadership? And as in the case of Gandhi, that, you know, after the lifetime of the leader, it tends to sort of uh, whittle away. Uh, what, 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 are, what are the factors? What are the structures? What are the elements? Uh, that, that make these things, uh, make these institutions and organizations well, work? I think the starting point always is an inner change. Mm -hmm. And I think the guru here is able to, to ignite something in the soul of these people. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But it is very impressive when people dedicate their whole lives to helping other people. And, and, and the kind of little uh, systems that they work out of, the pilgrimage to communities and how to help them, the kind of forest that they have regenerated through cooperative work, the fishing villages, as I said, but many other things. And I, and I it seems to me, yes, I think the management school should go and write cases and learn from them. Mm -hmm. You know, these are many sort of uh, small, this beautiful oasis uh, that, that exists, and there are a number of them that one can think of, you know, the work of Ramakrishna Mission, there's Baba Amte, many people doing yeah, that kind yeah, of work. Yeah. But do you tangibly, concretely feel that it is in the realm of possibility that this could translate at the national level, that this could be India? 
Well, uh, maybe no, but I do think that is more of India than what is in Delhi. Mm -hmm. I think that is India in terms of our traditions and backgrounds and philosophy. It is in the Baba Amtes and so on mm -hmm. that we find India. I don't think we find India in Delhi. Mm -hmm. I think we find a second-rate copy of the Western countries in Delhi. You have uh, also, um, in, in, in many ways, been uh, a champion of, shall I say, well, I was going to say lost causes, but let me say difficult causes. <laughs> and uh, in the mid-80s, mid it was to do with, with wastelands. Uh, and uh, it's not something that, you know, we often talk about. It's, it's, it's not sort of, you know, a part of popular, uh, you know, discussion of vocabulary as, as, as Narmada is or something. Uh, it's, it's, it seemed a somewhat sort of remote um, problem. Uh, why was this issue so important? It's a terribly important issue, even more important than Narbada. Sure, Nandwe. I'm sure, but it hasn't been a part of the, the public discourse, <laughs> hasn't been up front. If you look at, we ha India has 375 million hectares of land. Hmm? That's the size of it. More than half of it has, has been degraded. With increasing population and with half of our country degraded, what do you think is going to happen? We had 75 million hectares of forests. We now have 13, 14 million hectares left. And when we saw this data on the satellites, when we showed this data to Rajiv Gandhi, he certainly got interested in doing something about it and therefore helped in establishing the National Wastelands Development Board. I'm afraid I wasn't able to do very much there. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to open doors in government, I find, or at least I, my, I didn't have enough experience of government. I did open a window or two to um, NGOs, uh, to the Chipko movement, and in our first uh, event, the Chipko women came and uh, Rajiv Gandhi gave awards mm -hmm. to them and so on and so forth. And we have, I think, moved forward somewhat in terms of what they call the joint forest management movement. We have, I think, 20,000 or 30,000 joint forest management committees in which the foresters and the village communities jointly monitor and protect areas. We terribly important for the poor people and terribly important for the forestry people. Mm -hmm. But even here, although for the last 10 years we talk about joint forest management, who selects these com village committees is the forest people. I don't call that joint forest management. Mm -hmm. I call them subservient people, actually. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this is the first step. Hopefully other steps will be taken. Mm -hmm. All I can give myself credit for is opening a window mm -hmm. to civil society, to the villagers, mm -hmm. for having a little say in it. Mm -hmm. I've also been fighting another major battle, and haven't won as it, is the idea of decentralizing sapling raising, nursery raising, which is a million dollar business, and all the donor agencies support it. I want this to be decentralized to women in rural areas mm -hmm. so that they can earn a living and spread, and therefore you are spreading a, a way of earning mm -hmm. livelihoods. Mm -hmm. But the forest department will not do it. This is the sort of the, the cyclical uh, uh, dilemma, uh, a, a sense of uh, despair that uh, you know, there are individuals like yourself who come up uh, in the 80s and you, know, you raise an issue, someone else raises an issue on, uh, on, on, on leprosy, on, on, on what have you, uh, and then it sort of fades. And I, I use the word uh, you know, cacophony of the, the, the new development model uh, that, that sort of is, is, is dominant. Uh, do you despair? Do you really feel still? Uh, have you given up? Uh, you know, you, in a sense that uh, you know you're you're out of the sort of the active cycle of action, yeah. and you're now more the sort of uh, uh, well, I was going to say patron saint, but that may not be an appropriate description. Uh, but you know, you're more the elder stateswoman now. Uh, no, I, I no, I think there has been a considerable movement forward. I think in the forestry sector. In fact, there is some meeting going on on this issue today, 
here. And I, I do think the, the forestry sector has improved, but there are many, many, many more things to be done. And I think there are younger people coming up who are fighting the battle. Somebody has to take the first step. I think the first steps have taken. Other people will take other first steps. And I, I don't feel discouraged about it. I feel that things should move more for faster in government than they do. But mm -hmm. things are moving, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not very discouraged about it, actually. You're also involved with uh, several uh, educational institutions and schools. You have been an institution builder numerous institutions, far too many to sort of uh, recount here. Um, do you also feel that this is uh, a, a, another area, uh, you know, the decline of institutions, and I just don't mean political institutions, uh, you know, parliament and, and the judiciary or what have you, but uh, all our institutions seem to be giving in, in a sense. I agree with you, but, um, you know, you you don't search for things or institutions. I mean, if I happen to be a vice president of a education society, then in those issues you begin to bring in your moral concerns and your spirit of fighting for the right things. If you are working on forestry, you do it in that area. I don't think the platform matters all that mm -hmm. much. I think what one wants to do is to create a sense of doing the right thing wherever you are. And it's not easy because, as you said, there were a lot of corrupt people in all things. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in a definition I have of evil, which I'm mm -hmm. going to say mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. and which, which really influences the way I behave, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why I think I have to says when you have the opportunity and the ability to do good and you do nothing, that's evil. Mm -hmm. Evil does not always have to be an overt act. It can be merely the absence of good. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a guiding principle. Mm -hmm. I do fight mm -hmm. a great deal mm -hmm. for what I think is the right thing to do. I suffer a great deal mm -hmm. sometimes in the process, but mm -hmm. on the whole, I think mm -hmm. fighting for the right things mm -hmm. fearlessly mm -hmm. is important. You've and carried this note uh, with you. It's obviously something that, that moves you and, 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 and drives yeah. you. Uh, do you really believe in the notion of good and, and evil in that sense? Isn't there? you know, always a middle path, a gray area that we're lost and struggling oh, with. I, I do, I do, <laughs> I do. I, I, I think people who have gone through life with, uh, what's the word I want, um, some difficult experiences, as Gandhi did, let's say, in Peter Marisburg, and really came through that experience, learned fearlessness and fighting for the right things. Many of us go through these things in life. I certainly did. Mm -hmm. And I think I had learned to fight. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned to be fearless mm -hmm. to some extent. And it doesn't, the end result doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the process of wanting to move in the right direction that is mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Have you ever anguished about what the right direction is? That's frequently. Uh, confusing and, and uh, ambiguous. <laughs> no, I've never really thought about it. I at one time was going to be a musician, actually, in my, my career. Uh -huh. But since I have to, later on had to learn, earn a living and so on and so forth, so I changed into academics and became a professor and things of mm -hmm. that kind. But what is right and wrong, I mean? Right and wrong is what is deep inside you. I think you've been very lucky to, uh, to have had that clarity of, uh, of expression and vision. Tell me that uh, in, in, in the 60s, you were teaching at a management institution. Uh, you know, before that, you, you, know, you did a, a, a PhD in, in social psychology. Um, and and, and you know, there have been a few exceptional women who stand out 
um, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, right up to then. Uh, this was really before the women's movement had emerged, as it were. Uh, did you feel a sort of pioneer where you were? What was your self-perception there? There weren't too many women doing I what you were doing. I, no, I never really felt that I was doing because I was a woman, uh, really. I must really give great credit here to Vikram Sarabhai, who really helped me enormously in, uh, in gaining confidence, in, uh, in helping in moving in these directions which we shared and so on. So I, I don't feel that I've been fighting causes, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I feel I've been trying to do what I think is right. And what remains um, uh, for you? Is there ever a, a sense of uh, completion in, in, a, in a striving of this kind? Uh, or is it, as you said, you know, just a process? You keep doing what you can, and it just goes on. And there, you solve a few problems, but there will always be more remaining. And so it goes on. And, and there will be newer generations uh, who will continue this in, in other lifetimes for you. Well, yeah, I, I, I presume I don't have many more years to live, actually. But um, I, I hope that in the 21st century there are going to be a number of turning points. And I believe one of the turning points is in the kind of economic activities we have. And I think another important turning point should be the eradication of poverty all over the world. And I think there are many, many people all over the world who are working on these areas. If, if you are working on these areas, you meet them all over the world. And I, I feel very hopeful about the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the century in which Indian Renaissance is going to come. My goodness. And what might be the sort of, the, 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 sort of the buds that you see blooming of the, you know, in the Indian well, Renaissance. Look at Aruna Roy in Rajasthan. Look at Sainath in terms of what he writes. Look at the hundreds and millions of people in this Vadhaya movement or in the Brahma Kumaris who have recently come to know. There's just millions of people who So you see this in individuals? You see this in individuals or do you see it in, the, in, in an idea? No, I think there are a lot of good individuals. We, you, you know, they, if they come across a person, it blossoms forth, it's in them. And I think we have lots of very, very good people. Only the bad people are concentrated in Delhi. Governor mm -hmm. <laughs> Chaudhary, thank you very much. This has been a great Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>